Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode four of the Power of Witness series. Today we have David and Amanda on the top hot seat. And if you have a chance before listening to today's episode, go back and listen to episode 53 of our show. They were on there and it was helpful background. Uh, and if you, this is the first, happens to be the first Power of Witness episode that you're listening to, we highly recommend going back and listening to episodes one, two, and three that in your podcast player, because they'll have a lot of helpful information before diving into this uh, episode. Yeah. No, I think the framework that we lay out in the intro and then, yeah, like jumping in here, it will still be powerful, but it's going to be a lot better if you get a little bit of background. So absolutely. Yeah. And I wanted to say again, with with their permission um, that David and Amanda, with all of these couples, I did a 30 minute consult before we started the series. And this was just to get to know them and help them decide what they want to talk about. And we really hit it off and we really started to click on some um some issues that they wanted to dig in more. And so they, before we even did this power of witness that you're about to hear, they hired me to start working with them privately. So we had had a 30 minute consult focused on power of witness. And then we had a 90 minute session leading up to this. And so you're going to hear where we sort of, where we pick up from that 90 minute session. Um, so again, if you, if you hear a little deeper rapport with them, that, that would explain why this, I love the the work that we did in this session, especially because it highlights the importance of creating appropriate frameworks for communication and how if we don't set up, I call it meta conversation or process conversations where we can talk about how we talk about things, if we always are diving into content, then it just feels like we're chasing our tails. And I see this with clients all the time. I often say that when clients can start to shift to a greater percentage of their communication being meta or process conversation instead of content focused, that's when they really start to feel the dynamics change in a more, in a, in a positive way, in a healthier way. So you're going to hear, there'll be times where you'll hear both of them try to get down into the content and I'm constantly kind of bringing them back to let's come back to this framework we're trying to create. They've got these communication restraints, we call them, and we're trying to heal those restraints and bring more openness by fixing or or creating a better scaffolding or framework for how they communicate. It's a fun one. Yeah. And yeah. we also go oh, ahead. You go ahead. I would say we also wanted to mention that if you want to find out more about this Power Witness series, or if you want to join additional cohorts that Catherine is doing in February and March as well as beyond, you can go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, click on the resources tab, and there'll be a power witness option there that you can click and find out all the information as well as show notes for these episodes that include so many helpful links. Yeah, and you can also get to them in the show notes of your podcast player. We've got direct links that will take you to all of these uh, resources as well. So yeah, th- a huge thank you to David and Amanda for, for showing up and for being a part of this. Yeah, and let's jump in. Great. All right, so Amanda and David, welcome to the hot seat. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Good to be here. So I'll mm-hmm. just update mm-hmm. everybody. What's that, David? I said it's good to be here, we all. Thanks. 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 <laughs> um, so I'll update everybody. Um, I got to have a, a session, a private session with Amanda and David earlier in the week. Um, they decided to start some, some coaching, um, in addition to the group coaching. And I felt like we got some really got to some interesting places that will lead us into tonight. Um, so I thought I would review, give just a quick review, kind of where I remember us leaving. And then maybe we can start by you guys telling me how, what else you've thought about, what else, what other topic, what other conversation has come up um, around this idea since. Does that sound good? Sure. Okay. Sure. Mm-hmm. So we went through lots of things and, and David coined this term that I just loved about the, that they, that you two are struggling with communication restraints. And um, I love that word. And the way that I reframed it was that there, there's this 
honesty that you both really want to have that you had, especially at the beginning when the relationship energy was fueling it and the communication restraints so that word that you used, David, the way that I, that I saw it was like, it, there isn't this, like there isn't a safe framework for the level of honesty right now that you guys are wanting, wanting. Um, and as I do when it's one-on-one, I'm, <laughs> by the end of the session, I get pretty blunt. And I reminded you, I pointed out that I feel like you both have poisoned the pot of that, of wanting that safe framework, that you both have your own responsibility for why that framework doesn't feel safe right now. I hear, I was able to hear how much you both want that framework. You want it to feel safe. You want the honesty. Um, and it, when that happens, I think it can be really easy to look across <laughs> at the other person to look at the way they've poisoned the pot or why they're not making it safe. And so what I was asking you guys to do is to maybe get more reflective about how each of you have poisoned that pot. So um, I think I'll stop here and then let each of you kind of report in about what we, the areas we were talking that I had some, some ideas about where, how you all had each contributed to the, the framework, not feeling safe. And then we'll just continue where we left off. Does that sound good? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think we thought we'd give like a super brief, you know, our relationship is quite young um, relative to the relationships we've heard about. Um, in the previous sessions, Amanda and I have been together um, six, six years. years. Yeah, six years. Not um, that we're young, but we are young <laughs> together. We to, to, to um, you know, Bill and Felice and and um, and and Jill and Jack. It, you know, we feel like we're we're in the first inning, um, and we know that we want a long term, happy, healthy relationship. Um, we met as I was coming out of a 25 year successful relationship. Um, but, um, but wanting a very different life for myself. And Amanda was in fact in school working to build a, a different life for herself and for her, her daughter. It was I guess, six at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, that might have time, time flies. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, um, and, we, we pretty much immediately also went into business together. Mm-hmm. And so we, um, we, we, like we, we, we entered our relationship, um, as an open relationship and, um, and that had so much communication in it, as you were sort of saying, Catherine, like we really, we bonded so much in our exploration of things. Um, and there were things too that came on the table that we didn't, really um run the ground to think about it now as they kind of come back up but 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 we but we really bonded intensely and some of that had to do with you know how we would play with other people and some of it had to do with whatever long and short is um now you fast forward and we spend not just because of quarantine but like all of our work time is together and you know uh, so so that's a little background on us Okay. So, and again, I can review these if you, if you guys want the ones that I sort of guessed at the ways that you all have, have um, contributed to the lack of safety, but um, do you all, well, I'll just do that. And then you guys can tell me how those landed as you've had a chance to sit and think about them a little bit. So um, Amanda, the way that I, that I felt like just again, in the small amount of time that we've worked together so far that your desire, your um, habit, um, raising, we've actually found out that we live very close, uh, that I live very close to where Amanda was raised. So know this well, that Southern people pleasing, um, this um, freeze for survival. So if you feel threatened, it's, you're not likely to fight or flight. You're more likely to freeze, which can look very much to David like disengagement. And then he continues to try to get engagement when it, when you're frozen and that pressure of feeling like you need to say the right thing, please him and act makes you kind of burst under pressure. And we even kind of had a joke together about a bit of a Tourette's like you just would throw something out that maybe he wanted to hear, maybe sometime, I don't know, blah, just to sort of have something on the table. And that often what would pop out of your mouth wasn't even the truest truth for you. Yes. Right. So it could look to David, like you're just telling him what he wanted to hear. You um, pop out with a lot or so you tell him what he, what he wants to hear and you freeze or disengage 
when he's trying to reach for connection. And then when he really needs that connection, you pop out a lie. And lie is in air quotes um, because it certainly doesn't. Wait, we'll maybe say lie like. (laughs) <laughs> sorry let me just say lie meaning not necessarily with malintent more of a bleh kind of lie if that makes sense something that just pops out that isn't necessarily your truth and it's the diarrhea of the mouth that okay. just, just all comes out <laughs> mm-hmm. okay um and then for david this your side of the street that i was i was guessing about is um <laughs> when when amanda freezes in the absence of her giving information you fill in the story. Now, all of us fill in the story. That's what our brains want to do. Our brains want um, conclusion and an end. They want to know what's going on. But I think you are an especially crafty storyteller. (laughs) You're very cognitive and have a lot of skill in this area to fill in what you think it must be. And so you get pretty locked into the story and assumption and get pretty sure about them, maybe even before checking in with Amanda. Um, so then when you do check in with Amanda, it almost sounds like an accusation instead of a curiosity. The other thing we talked about is filtering her actions through the golden rule filter instead of the mm-hmm. platinum rule filter. So you're saying, okay, well, if Amanda does, if, if I did X, it would mean Y. Amanda is doing X, so therefore it must mean Y. And that is definitely not the case. Amanda doing X could actually mean A, B, and C. But in the moment of story and assumption, the filter you rely on most heavily is that golden rule. So it's been a couple of days since I landed those hypotheses in your lap. So let me know. Talk to me about how that's landing. What's your, how you all have discussed this. Let's just go from there. Well, I mean, I think it it landed um, very well because you know, I think, um, as I've said, and I think I mentioned it, um, when it first talked to Ben and Emma that, you know, communication is hard for me. It's probably hard for everybody in, in some form, but as you just pointed out, I have all of these kind of, uh, um, go-tos that, that kind of happen and, and trying to sit and figure out maybe why I, I do those things has, um, has been insightful, I guess, over the last uh, 48 hours. But, um, but it was, I mean, it, you know, David and I think you, we want to give you some of the world, but we don't always necessarily know how to ask for that. So it's, it's very um, frustrating to, to show up and want to give everything, but not be able to, to get there. And, but with the, the golden rule, um, that, that one is, um, has been, I guess it was harder <laughs> to, to really sit through that one. And, um, yeah, just, you know, again, finding the words, especially when, uh, it's hard for them to, to come to you anyways. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, take your time. And, and just put you into a, uh, you know, a spin that you have to pull yourself out of. Well, you shut down, yeah. you know, which <laughs> is, you know, can be, I mean, challenging, you know, whether, you know, in a lot of ways. And, and as you said, sort of Catherine, like, well, it's just, yeah, but then it becomes hard to know what is, you know, like a little bit, I think, um, Jack and Jill sort of referenced like kind of like understanding whether a yes is a yes because that's what you want or, you know, look, I mean, I've definitely in my 52 years experienced some benefit from the patriarchy and I'm, you know, somewhat insecure. So I don't always like know if what, you know, you are agreeing with, whether that's, you know, business or home or even, you know, in our, our non-monogamous journey, like, I don't know if that is in difference to cultural, like, like, it's hard to get, it's hard, it's hard to know when you're being true to yourself. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so hard to know if she's being true to herself and the extra layer of then also being truthful to you with you. Yeah. Yeah, because I end up seeing a lot of conflicts 
right? Conflicts okay. or contradictions? What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah contradictions, mm-hmm. probably. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And they manifest themselves in a lot of different ways, but, but they end up using me, and I'm um, definitely insecure. And, um, and, you know, I think, I mean, that we, one of the things we have in common, you know, is we both have very young mothers who raised us really on their own, but because, you know, um, our parents were so young, I think they made some mistakes early on that definitely, you know, give, sort of give me my own mm-hmm. script mm-hmm. that probably comes into play when Amanda sort of clams up and doesn't want to share, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, that could be as innocuous as like, what do you want to do this weekend? Or do you like this sex toy? You know, sure, sure. when that, that, when that, when that range comes into play and that just wasn't, didn't seem to be there when we met in, in our first year or two. And I go, well, I would extend, I would extend that, extend that spectrum even more from what do you want to do this weekend or what sex toy you like, you like, but even something that would maybe ping harder and closer to your heart is, do you still like me best? Am I still the one? Do you like this person? Is this, is this sexual position with this other person better than mine? Like some of the things that we get into with non-monogamy that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I think that all of the different questions we ask could pretty much the parenthetical phrase under each one, the meaning, the real question is, do you still like me best? Well, they all put Amanda into a uh, mode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Which may be a good example of the, of the golden rule. Um, I think through a lot of therapy with David and I, we, we do know that open-ended questions never land with me. They, they will immediately make me go completely blank and, um, and, and re- Sometimes that, you know, him knowing that and then asking me a open-ended question becomes, well, why is he, why is he trying to piss me off? Well, no, I forget. Or why is he trying to confuse? I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I hear that. You know, you know uh, somebody mentioned, I mean, I have my own sort of mental health challenges and uh, I'm bipolar and, and just, I don't, you know, I don't always phrase the question right. Mm-hmm. You know, sure. and, and, and I have my own intensity, but, um, you know, also obviously I'm sure it has its own set of triggers, but it also probably references sort of history or, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, we have our own, we have both David, our own Dave, I'm going to ask you to speak up a little bit. You're, I think you're sitting a little bit further back, so it's a little harder to hear you when you, when you speak. So, and I also, I think that that is, um, I love, I love both. I want to, I want to go back and slow down a little bit. I love what both of you just said. So Amanda, you owning the golden rule piece for you of thinking, um, well, you know, if I knew that open-ended questions made him freeze, then I certainly wouldn't ask them unless I was trying to piss him off. He's asking me open-ended questions. So he therefore must be trying to piss me off. Like that's a beautiful example of golden rule. And I'm sure as we say it that way, it's easy to see how that's the thing about that golden rule idea um, that I shared with you guys from the relationship bootcamp classes that is it's when we say it out loud, it sounds so ridiculous. But then it's, I think it's kind of painful because when we are thinking about it, we realize how we use it all the time, right? So I really loved your, your kind of a, a allowance and sharing why that was, why that can be difficult. And then David, I also want to say that I really appreciate your acknowledgement and admission that, yeah, sometimes you forget and you don't phrase the questions right. And maybe the part of that's your, your bipolar, some of it, I even wonder about, if, if you're asking an open-ended question when you're already feeling a bit threatened, so if you're asking an open-ended question, trying to get some, some connection or some reassurance or some soothing, if you're feeling a little threatened, mm-hmm. well, first of all, if you're feeling threatened, you're, the, the front of your brain isn't quite as online, the part that would remember 
that Amanda doesn't like open-ended questions or that it might make her freeze. Mm -hmm. (laughs) My other thought is that when you feel threatened, again, this story, this, this create the story or fill in the blanks, the needing to know, it almost, I always have this sense that maybe it puts you into the kind of this hypervigilant, um, like hound dog, like I got to figure this out. And so being very cognitive and verbal as a skill set of yours to be able to, and, and a very quick thinker that you go into like, okay, I'm going to ask these open-ended questions to try to get some information, to try to gather data, to see if I need to be as scared as I feel right now. And then Amanda can't give them to you. And it's like, oh no, this is bad. My worst fears are confirmed. A little confirmation bias. Hmm, maybe. Well, let me ask you, David, how did that land? Did that feel, as I've said, sometimes I throw needles against the wall and they stick and sometimes they don't. So if it resonated, tell me if it didn't tell me too, but just tell me if any of that landed. And if so, kind of how, and put it back in your words, in your own words, or if it didn't correct me and clarify. Well, you're, I mean, yeah, you're right. I, 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 I think out loud and, um, and, as as you know, it's kind of like you said. I mean, the golden rule doesn't quite work, right? Just because I think out loud, or because I want to get to an answer quickly, Amanda processes things very differently. And um, you know, like learning to deal with that is something that I've definitely been working on, and I think need to keep working on. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, my sense is you feel like you you working on being able to communicate sort of your, um, that you had a good term for it earlier, Catherine, like your truth. Mm-hmm. I mean, as I, as we, as I threw that out and hear David's confirmation of it, what, what insight does that give you? Or is, are there ways that you, that you see that from being in partnership with him? The, I mean, hyper vigilant asking the questions to, to get to an answer definitely sounds familiar. Um, and as I just said, right, like you may not necessarily understand or realize what's happening, but when I get that first open ended question and then I kind of freeze. And then, you know, I may, I may be able to get to the next one, but then, you know, if another one comes in, like it, it just becomes this cycle. And, uh, um, and I, I guess I need to learn better ways to say that, um, past the point of being able to, by the way, the way we've dealt with this is I don't ask questions anymore. I mean, that's, well, that's that, not yeah. good. well, but that's, I mean, I think we talked about this the other day, Catherine, is that, you know, basically, Eventually, uh, either I don't ask questions anymore because I've filled in the blanks, or you don't ask questions because if there aren't answers, or you know that the answers are are placating, mm-hmm. potentially potentially accurate, but also potentially a defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't I don't ask much. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, just sets up a whole other. Which is why we need a better framework. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and David, I think that it does make sense why you would stop asking the questions for both of those reasons. And then it would make you feel, uh, it, it takes away intimacy into me see. If you stop asking questions to see and to understand or for you to be seen and understood, you are, you are lowering your chances of and your, your, connection points for intimacy. And most of us start to distance. It isn't even like I am going to now distance myself. We just, without intimacy, it's a floating away almost. The intimacy intimacy brings us back together. And then when we are, you know, whether it's because we're busy raising kids or starting a business or da 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 da, we can just have this kind of natural float away, nothing intentional and malicious. And The intimacy brings us back, brings us back, brings us back. If we don't make time or effort for that intimacy, and I'm talking about sex, I'm talking about deep conversations, I'm talking about questions, any of the ways that we can see into each other and be seen. That's the, 
that's the lube. That's the, that's the, the Eros energy, right? Like we need that Eros energy, that intimacy to be able to continue to come back together and how lonely and how lonely that must feel. Well, I, I'm challenged because after the birth of my now 19 year old son, um, intimacy left um, my marriage and I, I, share some of like Bill's um, feelings of grief about, um, you know, about a wonderfully successful relationship with 25 years of monogamy. And I'm very, I'm a very um, erotic thinker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that, those open-ended questions, it almost sounds like I'm going to, I'm going to give them sort of two different flavors. Sometimes they might just be a, they could even be a front of the brain, adult driven desire for intimacy into me. See, I want to ask you these questions because I want to see into you. And by the way, I'd love it if you'd spin it back on me and want to know these things about me. And then the other time I would imagine you using these open-ended questions is when there's a threat to your attachment. And it's like, I need to see if you want to see into me. I need to see if you'll let me see into you. I need to see if this is going to be okay. That's right? very aftercare related, by the way. Sorry, what's that? That's very aftercare related. Say more. Um, you know, when, when I mean, not obviously with COVID and such, but not, not the case now, but in the times where we've explored, um, you know, the, that, that, that time for Amanda to process um, is it sometimes in conflict with my need to like reconnect and, um, and, 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 you know, and your need to reconnect verbally through deep conversation. Mm-hmm. Verbally and physically and just emotionally, just, just, uh, yeah. So all just, the different ways of intimacy. Stage five clearance ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. And, and, uh, Amanda, I'm going to, I'm going to come back over to you here in just a second. Um, cause I, there's a couple of framework things that I'm thinking of, but I also wanted to ask you when, when we, we talked about the, the time when David, does these questions and it's more about like soothing, like where he's gotten hypervigilant and he's needing to try to gather facts or see if, if these contradictions can line up where there's something that it's like a you know, it's fear is this, this hypervigilant fear. Trying to shut down the BS sometimes mm-hmm. where there's a s- assumption that there's a B- that there's BS. Okay. So we go back to the right assumption. Mean, BS in the, in the sense of, um, you know, the, 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 the homework that you gave us with oh, the belief, the belief system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's say that for the listeners. Cause they may not know. So, um, I want to, I had a client a long time ago that talked to me about his BS file and I just loved this. So BS standing for belief system also for bullshit. Right. And so we have these old belief systems that, that inform so much of our behavior and our, our motivation and our, our needs, the ways that we try to get soothed. And these BS files could be things like, um, I'm not good enough. Um, people can't be trusted. I'm not lovable. I have to hustle for love. I have to please people to be accepted. Um, Amanda, I could imagine you having a BS file about that one or, um, I better say something to get them off my back <laughs> or I better say something or they won't stop. Like kind of mm-hmm. this pressure type of thing. So these BS files that we have. Um, so if, you know, David, which BS file were, were you thinking of for yourself when you, when I was saying that you reaching out for soothing in that hypervigilant way? Mm, it probably, you know, it, 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 yeah, it's, re- it's, it's reconnecting after another um, person's been in our life mm-hmm. and, and there's been, you know, forms of intimacy. Mm-hmm. I have a need to, to really, um, you know, to just really reconnect. And, um, and we've, and we over the time have learned that, um, 
But what I'm asking is which BS file tab? What is the name of that file that you think really drives that? Like if you don't I get imagine, that imagine it's a fear of, of, of imagine it's related to a fear of being abandoned. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, my, my mom took, um, when she was 17 when I was conceived and, um, you know, she ended up taking, I think six months off or so after I was born and, and, uh, Apparently that left some impression on me. Yeah, that's quite a generous way to say it, that she took six months off like you were a, um, a job that she could furlough for a little while. Um, well, I, was with, I mean, I was with my father as a loving parent, but, you know, just, I mean, she was very young. And yeah. so, but, you know. but, but, but then she also came back and you were ripped from your father. So you got a double. Massively screwed twice I don't remember or, well yeah but your brain does your body does for sure okay so that bs file of i'll be abandoned so the aftercare of wanting to to reconnect to make sure all right we've in, we've introduced someone else into our life and again i i know as we talked about this is not your logical rational adult brain saying are you going to leave me for him but this this bs file going are you going to leave me for him? You know, like, am I going to be abandoned? So that, that need. So when I was getting there, I was wanting to, to ask you, Amanda, hearing it, you know, the way you presented it, like he knows I don't like open-ended questions. So when he's asking me an open-ended question, it's easy to think, why is he trying to piss me off? When we flip this and help to understand the open-ended questions more as a coping skill, to try to close that BS file of his instead of it being about trying to piss you off that this is more of a, a maladaptive skill in the moment, potentially, because it doesn't work in your relationship. It's adaptive at some point, maladaptive now to soothe himself. Does that shift anything for you about how you imagine sitting in those moments in the open-ended questions? Yeah. Yes. And I would say that I am, um, a natural giver of the benefit of doubt. Um, so, so I will always come back to, this is probably not about me. This is something with, you know, him, but, but then there kind of becomes a a point at which uh, I feel like I'm always talk. I mean, I'm always giving the benefit of, of the doubt. Always. Well, but, I mean, when I... And wait, 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 hold on, David, hold on one second. When you say I'm always giving the benefit of the doubt, I don't think that that's ever a problem to always give the benefit of the doubt. I think I'm hearing a part of the sentence of that maybe there's frustration that you don't feel like you get the benefit of the doubt back. That could be true. Very true. Okay. okay. Well, I was going to say maybe it's not always about somebody else or always about like both, like both can be true, right? So, you know, it, it, as Amanda said, it's challenging. Words, you know, can be challenging. And well, like I said, I don't ask because they don't come. I got a little lost there, David. Can you help me understand where what, what you meant there? Well, Amanda will freeze up but not answer, and that can be, you know, um, like I was saying, that could be. Well, what is, I guess I'm trying to understand what the help me loop back that loop that back into um, Amanda's answer about giving the benefit of the doubt and maybe feeling frustrated that she doesn't get it back. Uh, do you have any positions you're interested in exploring? Mm. And then having like no answer. So a question you have asked. So, is, so not every open ended question is about my past, mm-hmm. um, and no, you know, the, the challenge of input and always driving the bus you know, then you end up like, okay, is this just, you know, is this, is this just like, uh, but that's when you start to question the yeses because mm-hmm. then, well, is that really a yes or, or is it, you know, is, is the question just, you just don't want to, does that make sense at all? I guess I thought we were talking about this a little bit the other day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm following you. I'm, I think I'm, Wondering when you say the, if I'm the one kind of always driving the the bus, it makes me question what specifically does it make you question? Well, with the, with, with the, you know, right now with our communication, 
sort of loop of Amanda either wanting to be a pleaser or not giving much feedback because she's processing and then my not really asking much in the way of questions. Like it just, like you said, it, it ultimately what it, it ends up, you know, you end up being in roommate rep mode. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, if you're, if you're actively exploring, you know, um, ethical non-monogamy in some way, and the communication is sort of more forced, mm-hmm. but even then that's a little challenging because of the communication challenge. So, you know, as an answer, we need to, we need to work through a, a better communication framework. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm also just, I just, just now thought, Oh my God, how many open-ended questions have I asked Amanda just tonight? <laughs> <laughs> news to me by the way so i'm gonna i'm gonna try to be better about giving you some uh, true false multiple choice um <laughs> answers if that, if that she, still, she still loves me immensely even with the open-ended questions so <laughs> okay <laughs> i won't be voted off the island yet huh <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay so uh, let's get um i think this helps to we've, we've I, this is, of course, the struggle with a 50 minute um, time frame. But I think we've set the stage to understand some of the the back and forth of, of how these adaptive skills that you both have. They we used to be adaptive in some way. We are cl- getting clear that they are they have become maladaptive as as far as looking in, in service to your relationship. Mm-hmm. You are two very different people that get your needs met in very different ways. Um And so we need to look at, we could maybe start to work on this framework, start to maybe, maybe build the first level of the scaffolding to just start, let's start to come up with some, what are we going to do about this? That doesn't mean that the depth of what we could talk about isn't, is over. I'm sure we'll dive again and then that'll help us create the next level. Um, So one of the things that came to me as I was listening to you all go back and forth a little bit earlier is for me, oftentimes there's this cluster of this. And, and again, I shared this with you, David, that there's a lot that I resonate with your struggle. Um, in one of my relationships, I, I feel like I struggle to get some of that intimacy and get some of that, get as much information. I want to process everything verbally and that's not his style and, and some of that. And, and I, the three things that come to me when he does a kind of a, a, a contraction or, or a recoil is, my immediate is that I personalize it, catastrophize it, and make it an abandonment story. That's just where I go every time, mm-hmm. every time. <laughs> and so the work being not the flipping it on its head a little bit. And instead of trying to figure out ways for him to not retract or have the expectation that he won't retract, that when he retracts for me to stop and be like, oh, look, AFOL, you know what that means? another fucking opportunity to learn. Yeah. Thanks yeah. life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. Uh, oh, you got to stick your tongue way in your cheek when you say it, you know, like AFOL, give me some chemistry, please. I would rather have one of that, that a lesson right now. So I sit with the, the awful raw feeling of personalization, catastrophizing and abandonment immediately. Like that just happens every time he recoils. And then I have to say, what work can I do to depersonalize, not make it like, decatastrophize, not catastrophize, and shift the narrative that this is not about abandoning me. So that's one of the things I wanted to offer to you. And I just mm-hmm. I'm gonna stop talking for a second and see how that lands. Now, keep in mind, I just started with you because I resonate with you, not because you need to be the one that does the lion's share. I've got plenty of stuff I'm going to burn uh, toast Amanda's buns on here in a second, but how does that feel as 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 a challenge to you? Does that feel resonant, and does it feel like a challenge that you could do? And maybe we can talk about steps. It's not something I've done. So it's I, what? I, I I think maybe I've well, you know, I, I I think I mentioned to you, and 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 yeah, I did mention to you that like when I have had feelings and I've verbalized them that that has, has helped. Mm-hmm. And when Amanda has been able to hear them, they resolve. Mm-hmm. Um, um, when I, you know, or at least when I feel that she's been able to genuinely hear them and I don't know how to explain that, but 
I feel like I, I kind of know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, and your suggestion, which is a really good one, is for me to, to do that in my head, my own head. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, um, I need to do some experimentation with. Yeah, that makes sense. And to specify by doing it in your own head, um, counselories, we call that interpsychic work where you are talking, like saying that to yourself, like, okay, I'm having this feeling that I'm being abandoned because she's enjoying another lover in this moment. But actually, and you know, you, you talk to different parts or characters, some of the things we, we've talked about in, in uh, sessions past with some of our other hot seat. Um, victims, I mean, participants. Um, so we, <laughs> we, yes, we're le- learning on learning to do that within. But another thing I want to ask, that's interesting how you said that, that when you have feelings and you notice them, that's first. So you have feelings, you notice them, that's first. Then you are brave enough to share them. That's big. And then when Amanda can hear them in a genuine way, and you said, I just know, and I agree, we know when we are seen really seen, heard, really heard, understood, really understood. Even if it isn't their experience can understand and give us that leap of faith that they can understand that it would be that way. And then loved anyway. We need to know what that feels like because we all want it so badly. What are some ways that that you know you've been genuinely heard? Are, are there things you can point to that Amanda has done, a way she looks at you, a way she has responded to you? Is there anything that you can point to to give her some help? And because my guess is the way she's looking at you, she wants you to feel that all the damn time. Is there a way we can help her know how to do that better? I definitely feel very heard um, about, you know, about a lot of things about, about, you know, um, how I identify sexually about um, the importance to me of a, of a, a healthy and vibrant sex life to a relationship, um, about the importance of counseling, um, uh, and the importance of adult time for the adults to maintain their relationship, you know, in addition to the relationship with their kids. Okay. Um, so those are all wonderful things, the uh, ideas or things that matter to you that you feel heard on, but what is she doing that that helps you feel heard seeing you okay Okay, so showing up for showing up for counseling okay Mm -hmm. what else is there a way she looks is there a way she values her time is there a way she organizes things yes i mean she uh amanda's always investing time and energy in um in helping in, in, in helping facilitate my clear thinking, um, you know, uh, whether that's, you know, dealing with my OCD or, you know, or what have you. I mean, yeah, a man is always investing in our relationship. How about in the moment when you share? So it's wonderful that you feel heard um, by her in your, your sexuality. When you have shared a, a part maybe that you were nervous about or, or, or vulnerable in the moment, how, what did she do that made you feel heard? Podcast. I heard you have to use your words. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm, 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 um, um, uh, that's funny coming from me. I was about to say, there's some <laughs> irony here. The man is saying you need to use your words, David. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like it's, it's, it's okay. You, can, Take your time to process. Can you restate the question? Like, help me understand. Like, so you're t- you've you've part. given examples of what of what she has heard and the way, like the the areas that you have felt her, felt heard in. Wonderful. You've told me that you've shown me. Give me examples of evidence that she heard you. She shows up for counseling. She invests time and energy to help your clear thinking. What I'm asking is more in the moment when you have shared something, what does she do with her body, her eyes, her, her voice? What does she do in the moment to make you feel heard? Or does she, is it more like you got to wait and see the action? I don't know. I'm just curious. I could feel more heard in the moment. You could feel more heard in the the moment. Okay. And what might that look like? Well, 
I mean, really, I think it, I think it, it all, you know, it all, it all depends on, again, it goes back to just our connection, right. And, and how connected we feel at a given time. And I think that's, you know, and I think for a lot of people, I'm sure for a lot of people, especially with the, the quarantine, um, you know, we're, 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 we're with each other all the time. And so, um, can I, um, I asked you an open-ended question. Can I throw out some multiple choice for you? Sure. Okay. <laughs> like that. So, um, I'm thinking, I'm guessing from what we've talked about that some of your, the most natural love languages for you in receiving love would be physical touch. Good guess. And words of affirmation. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds like the way that you, that, that you have learned to, to see and fe- to see and feel Amanda's love is probably in her acts of service. My guess is she probably does acts of service really naturally. And that, that, she, oh, and by the way, David's Ooh. nodding a lot, um, <laughs> for, for podcast world out there. Um, and that, you know, when you are in your clearest, most adult, you can probably tune yourself to the frequency of, um, acts of service, love coming in, but that's after the moment in the moment is actually a one wonderful opportunity to feel heard using your native love language of her grabbing your hand and repeating your words back to you in, from the way that she understands it, that that might land more in the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's see multiple question, uh, true or false. <laughs> would that land for in the moment <laughs> that physical touch and repeating your words yes I'm, I'm definitely very um touch oriented and and i mean we're yeah we're we're big snugglers but, um so with that in mind knowing that physical touch and words of affirmation are the way that you feel love most at your most vulnerable anything else that you might ask her to do to help you feel more heard in the moment participate you know be, be be more confident in her own voice and and um you know like we were highly highly communicative in you know our first year we were just incredibly communicative about our 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 wants needs and desires mm-hmm. and um that you know in some ways that feels the not in some ways that communication has waned as life sort of gets in the way. Okay. All right. So I'm going to um, encourage you to think about this some more and give this act of service person a list of how she can do an act of service. Her, so in her, and again, I'm guessing this, but for her act of service, reaching out and holding your hand would be an act of service. Now, those of us that are physical touch people, it's like, no, you just touch. But for an active service person, we have to kind of switch it and say, grabbing my hand when I say something is an act of service to me. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so help just kind of thinking about that. You might be able to task her with some ways to help you feel more heard. Now, Amanda, this is another place that we've talked about, um, you know, where David has said that, has mentioned, and you agreed that in the beginning, you all were, were much more communicative about your wants, needs, and desires, and that you agree that you are less communicative of that. And we talked a little bit about what has made it not feel safe to communicate your desires. So David's saying, yes, participate and be confident in your own voice. Is there a way that, that David could make it feel safer for you to show up in confidence in your voice? Oh, that's so open-ended. No, no, no. I can answer that one though. Okay. That's fine. Um, I mean, a lot of it is in his response, right? And uh, um, and and just it, we all have to hear things that we don't necessarily like to hear, right? But um, we can definitely make it easier on others to tell us those things that we don't want to hear by remembering that hearing them is what gets us to the next stage that that's what gets us to the the next level um so 
you know, I, I think, yeah. You know, and, and, and as you know, I'm a people pleaser and, um, I, I can't, I can't hurt people's feelings. <laughs> Right. I can't, but I've asked you to hurt my feelings so many times over and over again. And you, what, what? Again, but you, you asked, I, haven't, I don't know that you have necessarily taken it all that well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you, when we're talking about necessarily kind of in the beginning, right? Cause in the beginning you, you, um, you don't know what people's responses are going to be. So you don't start to adapting your own behavior, I guess, in order to predict those. Mm-hmm. Okay. There we go. Um, that is a skill that you definitely learned is to be adaptive, to be flexible. And it's, it almost sounds like you say it, it's like a, I imagine it being a pretty auto unconscious auto response of you trying to fold yourself into the pretzel or be adaptive, not ask that question. That's going to ruffle the feathers. Um, almost like a, where you maybe learn to be hyper vigilant for the emotional equilibrium of the people around you. And so without even thinking about it, you are trying to mold the situation and try to make it easier. Yes. Pleasing them. Yes. And David's like, well, just quit that shit and hurt my feelings. And you're like, like, it isn't that easy. It's such an auto response that we've got to stop much like the auto response for you, David, of personalization, catastrophizing and abandonment. It just happens that Amanda's without consciousness is going to be to try to be adaptive and make it safer and people please. It doesn't mean she can't go beyond that, but you both having some compassion and grace and generosity for each other's auto response and not get locked into what happened in the auto response. So for instance, if, if Amanda starts to like, say, if you kind of see her doing the adaptive hustle that you might be able to say, you don't have to hustle with me. Remember, I'm not going to be mad at you. I really want to hear your truth. (sighs) Okay. Then she might be able to do some autocorrect. Or Amanda, if you see, if you kind of shut down and you see David start to amp up and like reach for more of this questioning and more of this soothing, you might be able to say, I'm not going to abandon you. I am here. And then he Mm -hmm. can go, okay, right. Auto response. Let's see if I can correct with more consciousness. Yeah. What? So here's what I wrote of what you said, Amanda. So I write these notes, but they're my response. They're my summary of what you said. So I said, is there anything that David can do to make it safer for you to be confident in your own voice? And my summary was his response. He can make it easier to share what he doesn't want to hear. I need for him to remember that me sharing is an attempt to get us there, to get us to that intimacy. Does that sound right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm also wondering about, I also heard you say that David doesn't always, when he said hurt my feelings and you've tried you've done it, it hasn't always gone well. And I heard that and I'm noting it and we don't have time to get into that tonight. So for the next time, mm-hmm. but in more of just a, a little bit of a takeaway for you, have you ever done any asking or requesting about the pace or the amount of information or connection you do at one time. I don't know, David, I don't know. Again, you and I, res- I resonate a lot with you. Sometimes it's like if the door cracks open and I see a little intimacy or a little like capacity for deep emotional connection, I'm like, Oh boy, here we go. Let me get my journal out. I've got all these things I've been waiting to talk to you about. And I can absolutely fire hose exhaust my partners. Mm-hmm. Does that sound like it fits here, Amanda? Like if that maybe you could do it, if it wasn't quite so much at one time or without so much intensity at one time. Well, definitely the, the second one. Um, I think, I, I, I think, I think there's so much of myself that I have wanted to share and, um, have been willing to share, but haven't gotten there yet. Cause for whatever reason, um, 
is it is there is there anything about this that could be potentially made better by pace a shift in pace and intensity well so yeah i mean yes definitely if, if the intensity was brought down i could i could share a whole lot more and what would that what would the intensity being brought down what would that look like or feel like how might how would david know Mm. well just like david said earlier that you know he 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 knows and you said too like we know when we are being seen and heard um i know when david comes to the table um to hear me or to validate something else that that has you know whatever um, so like his own need to, val- to validate validation. Yes. Okay. I mean, you can just tell in, in the questions, right? The, um, in the response questions. So, and uh, so I guess the intensity would be brought down if I felt like he was, he was really asking questions to get a deeper understanding without any of his own shit involved, which is hard. Yeah. And I don't want to get into it, Catherine, but you know some of the questions I ask and the answers don't come for years and that's challenging. Yeah, sure. It's um and so sure there can be some intensity built up in in, in them because you feel like you haven't gotten them answered. Um I, the word I wanna maybe end with is um see if this resonates, Amanda, maybe asking for a mm, more of a focus on curiosity instead of a drive for validation or a drive to an end, like maybe a little more lighthearted curiosity. Does that mm-hmm. sound right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. True or false? That's true. <laughs> okay. um, and David, yes, that's hard when you've got this backlog I mean, it naturally builds intensity. That's what a dam does, right? When you when, it, when you felt dammed up or you felt um, stymied in your in your attempts, there's this backlog of things you want to connect with and understand and 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 ask. And that is not easy work to slow down, slow to her pace. <laughs> And I don't mean that with judgment, like you're, it's just a different pace. It's a different emotional stamina. Mm-hmm. Another way that I is coming to me. And then we're done. I mean, that's why we're working with you. Sorry. What's that? That's what we've done. That's why we're working with you. You've done what? Mm-hmm. Really not, not engaged on, on, on this part of our relationship. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I guess what I'm saying is instead of it being not engaged or fully engaged that there is a way to engage differently and trying to engage with a more lighthearted curiosity and noticing when you feel that intensity of the dam backing up and you doing that inner psychic work of being like, Hey boys, meaning all of your inner parts. I need one question. You guys decide which ones, but I'm only bringing one to the table tonight. You know, and like, let them send the one that matters the most up and then say, this is the only one we're working on. And I want to be curious and I want to give space and I don't want to have 16 follow up questions because that's going to shut her down. And to be able to invite her into this instead of like impacting her, like we must decide this today kind of thing, which can happen with that build up. I, I understand. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop us here. We could definitely keep going. Um, You guys are really in a rich, ripe place to do this work. I can see um, how much it matters to you right now. So if without stopping, we would keep going all night. So I'm going to stop um, and give you both a chance to take a deep breath and share a takeaway before we shift to feedback. Well, I mean, I guess working, working on the, the, golden to platinum rule i can see how for me that that works kind of on changing a mindset but also working on putting the words to to both my my wants and needs and you know 
taking care of my partner. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I can see, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't need to fill in the blanks. Um, I'd like some of the blanks to be filled in by Amanda. Um, and uh, that'll happen, I guess, you know, on her, when, it, when that works for her. Um, and uh, then Martin to be okay with that. Mm-hmm. I will go ahead and mention, because we've already talked a little bit about um, teen, or, you know, the rebellious teen chair character. Um, that sentence of wanting these to be filled by Amanda, yes, it will happen when it works for her. My rebellious teen would have a freaking heyday with that. Like, oh yeah, let's just wait some more till it's convenient for her. That would be like fodder for my for my rebellious teen. So uh, maybe another way is taking yeah. and some, some of that is true that it it would be like kind of waiting, in, but there instead of just releasing the power in that way, which your rebellious teen will not like, is more like when I get in that space of wanting to impact and do it's like, how how can I shift this to be more inviting? How can I bring that lighthearted curiosity? How, which of these questions would be the one that feels the most important that I can stay lighthearted in and fill in. So you get to take some of, some of that power back and some bringing some of that back into your locus of control. Okay. All right. Thank you guys. Let's, um, you guys get to take big, deep breaths. Now the real deep breaths. Um, we're going to we'll go back to, uh, to feedback from everybody. And then again, remember you have one more bit on the hot seat where I ask you to share what it was like to be on the hot seat. And then I'll ask you to share what it felt like to get the feedback. So we'll come back to you at the end. All right. Who would like to start? Um, we're, we're happy to go first. I mean, we, I mean me, I can't speak for the both of us. I'm happy to go first. Um, well, for one, thank you guys for, I mean, I just can't get over how brave you are, Amanda, just sharing this piece of you that, you know, that communication is so hard for you and that, you know, questions and all this, and you're here on a podcast with other couples and, you know, I mean, like, wow, that's, that's amazing. And I mean, way to really like grow, I mean, try to grow as a person doing things that are hard. So that's, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and David, I can just relate so much to you when you're like really questioning <laughs> and you maybe want a specific answer and you're not getting that. And then you just ask more and more questions. Um, I can relate to that a lot. <laughs> and when you said, um, you know, then we just end up roommates and I, I hear that from my partner and it's like a punch in the gut. I mean, it's, it's, it's rough to hear that. And the people pleaser in me, Amanda feels like, man, I am doing something so wrong. So I just really appreciated hearing from both of you and just really could relate to that. So it's, it's a, like a, you both talking is emotional for me, so thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Laura. Casey here. As we heard Laura, um, a lot of what you two said really seemed to resonate. Are just the the difficulties, um, the the communication style differences, the uh, maybe the love language differences, um, is something I feel that her and I battle um, a lot. Um, I, David, when you said, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm an emotional person and I, I have a lot of emotions, but I can, I can deal with hurt feelings. And I feel like sometimes my partner doesn't realize that, you know, she doesn't want to hurt my feelings. Um, but it's okay. And trying to get that point across or, or just having that that same feeling of it's okay. You know, I, I mean, I'm not fragile. I won't, the world won't collapse if, if that happens and I can move past that. Um, and then also being, you know, afraid to ask 
questions or, um, you know, really having the ability to communicate, I guess, in the, in, in the right way where the questions are heard uh, and not misinterpreted and, and some of that. So I, I'm just rambling now because, yeah, you you guys speaking really, really did hit some chords uh, with me. And I appreciate both of you guys sharing and being vulnerable. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Casey, I just want to um, remind you that we are all emotional people. We just don't <laughs> um, all share them. And, and I, I just say yeah. that because I, I, for people that say, oh, I'm not an emotional person, that's not true. They're just shut down to that, to it. And so uh, from one um, emotional person to another, I always say it's like, well, shoot, that's one less bit of counseling I got to do because I don't have to like unpack to be able to emote. I'm just, I do what I, I do it pretty naturally. So I definitely wanted to, uh, to mention that. And boy, oh, Laura, when you said that about the, like asking more and more questions to try to get the soothing, that one really hit me. So feedback on your feedback. Great work. You guys Who's next. We'll go ahead. All right. We'll go out of order. Well, I can't speak for myself, but Emma wants to go. First. <laughs> I was going to say, actually, usually I go first. You should go if you're ready. Yeah, no, I I think, I mean, first of all, just the he, the amount of courage it took to come on like a public forum and, and do what you two did is incredible. So thank you for that. And, and I think, you know, as Catherine said, like, you're obviously both very committed to like getting, like making this better. And, and you, it sounds like you do both connect in so many ways, right? You we run a business together and you do so many things very well together, but there's like these couple of sticking points. And I think that's something that we can relate to, um, and hits home. Like we, we sync up like, you know, a huge percentage of the time, but then there's these gaps and then those gaps like expose like these huge problems that are very difficult. And I think there was, it was interesting. I thought like there was multiple times and I know we're not here to like pick teams, but like, as you were each speaking, I was like, Oh, I'm like Amanda. And then a minute later, I'm like, no, no, I'm more like David. And then I'm like, no, no, I'm more like Amanda. And so like, it was weird how I kept trying to like fit us into your boxes. And I was like, why it's you each combined some, some qualities of each of us. And that really kind of messed with my head. Cause I was like, well, I don't know how you can be part me and part Emma. So I don't, I haven't figured out how to unravel that, but yeah, I just, a lot of it hit home and thank you for, for being here and sharing and, we appreciate it. And Finn, if you don't mind, let me jump in. Or Emma, if you don't mind, let me jump in. Um, mm-hmm. Finn, one of the things I'll mention is that I often see this in couples where the more we do together and the more we do well together, the more often we're on the same page. That when we're not on the same page, you said it's a huge problem. And I want to point out in perspective, it probably isn't all that huge, but it can feel so huge because we're not used to being on different pages. It can feel like a really big attachment threat when it really isn't, but it can feel so big because we're not used to it. And we tend to be the couples in our circles that people look to and think, wow, they are so strong and so steady. And they, they've they got this because we are on the same page a lot of the time. So I always like to remember that when I start, when I feel like my husband and I are having a huge issue, I'm like, wait a minute, is it actually huge? Or is it just because we're not used to struggling with things? So, anyway, go ahead, Emma. Um, first off newsflash, we are figuring all of this out just the same as you two, all of you, all of, all the listeners, everyone, you know, we, we are, we have our own shit to deal with and, and we're working on it. Um, but I wanted to say thank you again to Amanda and David for being brave. And like Finn said, this is, yeah, this is a big step and, and we really appreciate you being willing to do that. And similar to what he said, I was trying to pick sides too, of like seeing which one, which one I related to more. And I, I, I also relate to both, um, of you in different ways. And, um, you know, at the very beginning when Catherine called it communication restraints, which I think there's a term you two brought up, um, and that you've poisoned the safe framework that really hit home. Um, there's, yeah, I could just relate to that a lot in in realizing that there's things that have happened over time that you don't necessarily always realize that you're doing uh and it can it can start to poison that safe place in 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 a different 
different ways. And um, that really hit home. The idea of the BS files uh, and belief systems also hit home. And the inviting the inviting you into to the safe space, inviting you to share that I can relate to that a lot too, because it's something that I uh, am really working hard on being better at rather than pushing and pushing and pushing. And instead of inviting, uh, it's not always easy. So um, yeah, I just thank you so much for being here and for sharing and being brave and, and uh, it's amazing. So thank you. Great feedback, you guys. I was. Can I throw one other thing out there, Catherine and and David? I mean, I was. There was an analogy I thought of with the open ended questions versus the closed. You know, the yes no questions. That it was interesting because you know I I don't know everything that you know that David does for a living, but like if if sales was any part of it, like you're trained often to ask open ended questions and then listen to the customer to find out what their needs are and how you can then take what you have to help meet their needs. And like, I also thought of the, the flip side of like when you go to the optometrist and you're looking through the little lenses and he's like a or B one or two a or B one. And you're just like constantly like narrowing it in. And like, it's, it's really hard to, like you're just guessing at that point and you're like, I don't know, does she like this one or this one? We'll try that. And then she seemed to like that one. And then maybe we'll keep that one and we'll add a new one. And then we'll, and you're, but it's hard. It gets hard to be, you start to internalize that and be like, well, right now I'm the one that she said, it's this one. But if then, if there's another one and it's this him or him, and then it's okay, well, it's him today. And then, and so it's just a weird I don't know. I didn't have anything really like relevant with it. It just was kind of like an analogy I thought of that. I was like, it's the sort of the two sides of the coin. You've got like the salesperson versus the optometrist and the optometrist doesn't look at you and go, well, what, what strength glasses do you think you need? <laughs> right? Like, that's not how it well, works. That's so that's yeah. a great analogy. And actually it reminds me, it made me think of something too, that, you know, the Amanda, if you, if you are feeling at all on the spot, or if it brings up an old trigger of, of being on the spot to have, to have to be questioned, even if it's coming from your loving partner who wants to know you, if that at all gets, if that get, if that message gets twisted and it starts to feel like you're on the spot or about to be in trouble, or you're going to say the wrong thing. And so it feels triggering mm-hmm. the part of your brain that's going to be lit up is a part that is black and white binary fight or flight. <laughs> It doesn't want an open-ended discussion about whether you should run around the maple tree or the pine tree. It just wants you to fight or flight so you can survive. And so that might be one of the reasons why open-ended questions, it's like, does not compute. Like, the, uh, la, 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 la. like I, I need it to be binary. Is it one or zero? Mm-hmm. So that's an, that might be another interesting way, David, for you to have some depersonalized understanding that if it seems like, you asking these open-ended questions or pulling her back, it might just be because the part of her brain that could respond to that is not online. Not that it has anything to do with you. It's interesting because Tumblr was a fair portion of our courtship mm-hmm. and we would look at Tumblr together. And I'm know. still grieving Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, to look at something, you know, I can always look at something visually and go, Oh, that looks fun. Or look at something visually and go, no, 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 I'm not, not into that. And there, it was very easy to share those pictures and, and, and yeah, sad tumblers gone. Well, I feel really confident that between the two of you and what you do for work and your, your creativity, you can find a way to, to harness this information about the binary close ended questions versus those prefrontal cortex open-ended questions to be able to find some common ground in that. Okay. We're breaking, breaking protocol here. Let's go back to feedback. It looks like Bill and Felice are waving and they're going to get real close to their computer so we can hear them. I sure hope so. We've got near the speaker. Um, first thing I want to say is just the word that comes to mind is just courageous. I'm just courageous and grateful that, that uh, you two are, so willing to share this, you know, big meaty topic that, you know, and, and work on it. Uh, it's, 
the the thing that it brought to me was made me think about some of the big things that we when we were early in our relationship we couldn't talk about that were just simply off limits and that we couldn't get to that were just basically forbidden and how important it was but how difficult it was to do that work to try to un, you know to try to open those things up and that for you to do this out and open and out in front of all of us like this was was really special it was really a, a fantastic thing that you're doing mm-hmm. and uh you know i just you know wish i could reach through the video screen and hug you guys for for being you know so brave and so willing to do something like this mm-hmm. it's just really special and uh you know it, it made us think about all the all the work that we've done and how and more than that, how that work can pay off and how that work is, is something that can really benefit every portion of your life uh, together. And, uh, you know, we wish you guys just the very best in, in, in getting through this. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I ditto what Bill said. I, I think this is a really um, tough issue to say, you know, so I appreciate you being vulnerable with us. Um, I really related to David because I too am bipolar, uh, with good meds, um, raised by a bipolar mother. So, um, I understand the need for, uh, high level communication because you do fill in the blanks with, um, your version of the story. I don't know if that's a bipolar thing or just everybody does that, but um, catastrophizing, I really um, that word really hit me intensely because I do do that. I mean, not Bill. Bill and I have great communication, but like at work sometimes or with the men that um, in my life that um that we, that I play with that are my FWBs. I have one in particular that gives me a lot of um, stress and I catastrophize a lot. And then he says, why are you thinking that way? And I go, I don't know. Cause you're not talking to me. <laughs> I need input. <laughs> Tell me you like me. Tell me I have a good ass. Tell me anything. <laughs> And uh, he's like, I, I'm not that kind of guy, he says. And I'm like, for two, it's almost three years, and I have to just accept him for who he is. And um, I get that. So I really related to that. Um, and, you know, I guess this might be um, a bit of um, advice. And I don't want to feel like that because I know Catherine wouldn't like that. <laughs> but I think every good relationship needs a communicator, a pusher. Um, Bill's a pusher. And, um, and so that really, I know that maybe David asked you questions, but I think that shows caring and support. And um, I think it's healthy. I don't want to be give advice, but that's the way Bill Bill demands it, and I I after thirty five years of it, I don't even think twice about it anymore. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I love the part that you brought in love languages. That's that's very meaningful to me. I'm an acts of service person, um, and so Bill's really good at that. <laughs> Yeah. Because I'm a people pleaser. He's a people pleaser. And uh, that was very useful to us when we talked about that uh, last time. So, um, anyway, just really good stuff. Thank you. Thank, oh. thank you, Felice. That was lovely. Um, all right. Jack and Jill. David and Amanda, first off, I want to thank you for your vulnerability and honesty. Um, as you know, Jack and I, we've done hot seats and just to be, keep your train of thought and yet remain open and honest is it's kind of like walking a fine line. It's not, it's not easy. So 
congratulations. You did fantastic at it. Um, and what kept coming up for me was a safe container. And I know for Jack and I to learn to use our voices, both of us in, in a, in a productive, safe way, like without passive aggressiveness or without, um, you know, double, double meanings to our words or to our questions or filling in the blanks, like you talked about has been one of our biggest challenges. So I feel you guys on that and (laughs) just know that, you know, you're not, not alone and you're not, you're not anywhere where you're not supposed to be. Like you said, you're only together six years. Well, I mean, why did we just start figuring this out two years ago? (laughs) There's, there's no finish line and there's no starting line really. So thank you. Thanks Jill. Yeah. David and and Amanda, this is Jill. Jack, this is Jack. (laughs) Uh, I'd like to thank you for your courage. Um, it's you, you brought up some heavy stuff and, and I could see, you know, I could see myself and both of you in the, in the times where we're in conflict and it just feels like my hands right there. And I want that connection, but I get in my adolescent and start beating things and fucking shit up. So thank you for, for being that mirror for, for me, for us. And yeah, incredibly brave, incredibly, I see, I see what this means to both of you and that you're, you're willing to put in the hard work to, 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 to work through this. So you got, you got the want to, (laughs) you got this. Thank you, Jack and Jill. All right. Thank you all for your feedback. So Amanda and David will end with you. I'll ask you to both report on what it felt like now that you're 30 minutes post, how was the hot seat and then how it felt to hear the feedback. You know, I think for me, I've always believed that anything that was worth doing is supposed to be hard, that that's the way that the universe dev- you know, designed it. Um, so I've always been willing to accept that, but, you know, knowing that as Emma said, you know, we both, and as you said, Catherine, that, you know, we both poisoned that pot and, um, and and just kind of, you know, owning, owning that. But, um, so the hot seat, you know, it felt good to kind of feel like we're getting closer. We're doing some of the hard work. Um, and I would say hearing the feedback felt great because it has been hard work. This isn't easy for me. (laughs) Um, you know, Actually, the first podcast that we ever did was Ben and Emma's, and I can just remember that every word barely came out. So um, thank you for having us back again so that we can continue our our hard work because we are worth it. Yes, we are. Um, this has been a really incredible relationship, and this has been an incredible process. You know, hearing um, uh, Bill and Felice, uh, there were so many things that both of you said that resonated for me and that I know resonated for Amanda. And then, you know, um, in the next session with with Jill and Jack, um, again, so many things that just, you know, struck both of us. Um, and Catherine, that's why we reached out to you, wanting to, to start working with you, because we could see that this was really, like, um, impactful and that we had stuff we want to work on because we intend to be uh, partners for a hell of a long time. And, and, and ever and ever and ever. Forever and ever. So um, <laughs> the feedback is, was great um, because it's starting to cool a little bit down on the hot seat, so that's nice. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, thank you both so much for your bravery and yes, for really bringing a, a juicy, tough, you guys are really in it, um, uh, issue to the table to work on so publicly. It was uh, really brave and obviously very impactful because of how much 
bravery. I think like the more the, the more brave you feel like you need to be to bring an issue, often the more impactful sharing that issue with other people is going to be. And you all certainly embodied that. So thank you. And we will <laughs> look forward to um, Laura and Casey next week and uh, as our last hot seat. And then we'll do some wrap up. Thank you all. Have a great night. And we're back. Thank you again to David and Amanda for showing up and being vulnerable. As I always say, like it's just amazing to have all of you be so authentic and open with all of us. So thank you and thank you to all of us on all everyone on the hot seat. I'm sorry. Thank you to everyone who's in the on the bleachers and listening and witnessing. And thank you, of course, to Catherine as well. And again, this is another one where I was really blown away by the feedback. Um, it's we keep talking about the hot seat, but I really want to, again, highlight the benefit and encourage you to listen to the benefit that the couples that are in the bleachers, how they're learning to give better feedback, the impact it has to the people in the hot seat, and just to take a minute to imagine how much better the communication is getting between these partners as they're learning to give better feedback to others. And I think you really start to see that the more these episodes go on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that as well. And as we said in the intro, more information and show links to everything in, in our show notes are on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com or in your podcast player. And next, next week, week, next Friday, you will have the opportunity to listen to Laura and Casey on the hot seat. So if you have a chance before next Friday, listen to their episode, episode 105 on our show for more information. Uh, yeah. Anything else you have to add? Nope, you said it all. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. Okay, bye everyone. Thanks for listening.